Hello, EcoQuest Challenge volunteers, and welcome to this month's EcoQuest Challenge. It's great to be back. This month's EcoQuest Challenge is called Wooly Bully. And you might be asking yourself, Brent, are you talking about that 1960s song by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs that gets in everybody's stuck in everybody's head from time to time? No, I am not. I am talking about a bully that is wooly found in our forest that is taking over our native hemlock trees. It's called the hemlock wooly adelgid. And if you ever seen a hemlock have this sort of like whitish coating on it right at the base of the needles, that's it right there. That's hemlock woolly adelgid, and it's taking down a lot of our native hemlock trees. And it's up to you as citizen scientists to do something about it, to help us map it so that we can better come up with a solution moving forward. So that's what we're going to be focusing on for this month. And this video is going to be broken down to a couple of different pieces. So I'll be talking about why hemlocks are important for our ecosystems. Why should we be protecting them? Then get into hemlock woolly adelgid ecology as well as their identification. And then of course, how to go about actually mapping it and helping out. This month is a little bit different too, because we're gonna be partnering with the New York State Hemlock Initiative and New York IMAP Invasives as a team to help and try and map this so that we can come up with solutions to protect our native habitats against Hemlock Woolly of Delgid. So let's get right into it and get started. Before we get into the nitty gritty, of hemlock woolly adelgid and even hemlock ID, let's take a step back and think about the resource that we're trying to protect. So first of all, native hemlocks are the third most common tree in New York state. They provide unique ecosystem services that benefit human residents, animals, and plants. They're what are considered a foundation species. Well, what does that mean? Well, they create the ecosystem in which they reside. So in other words, Hemlock stands create the unique soil and water conditions that support that native diversity of life that we're, life that we're trying to protect. Lots of wildlife utilize um, hemlock habitat. For example, deer, moose, grouse, porcupines all use hemlock stands for shelter in addition to native understory plants that we're also trying to protect. Hemlocks are also what are called a climax species, meaning that when they are mature and they grow up to you know, full height, they represent a mature and productive forest ecosystem, a forest ecosystem. Hemlocks are very slow growing, they're shade tolerant, and take a long time to reach the canopy and provide those conditions for those, uh, the native wildlife and our native understory to really thrive. So we need to protect this resource. They're also very important for water quality. Hemlocks are often found along streams and shorelines of lakes. Um, they have a very shallow branching root system, which helps to filter out agricultural runoff and pollutants from entering drinking water supplies. So they're often found and even purposefully planted around reservoirs to protect water resources. They provide shade that's necessary to create ideal water conditions for cold water fish, like our native trout species, so that they can reproduce and flourish. So it's not just about protecting hemlocks. It's really about protecting that native food web that they that that helps to support. Th even thinking about linkages between fish and, and trees, you know, that, that often people don't even think about. So why the need to preserve our hemlocks? Well, hemlocks are being infested in our region by this little critter here, the hemlock woolly adelgid. And this is a byproduct of this little insect. It's actually an aphid-like pest that came to the U.S. from southern Japan, where it's, um, where it's a, you know, a native hemlock pest. And of the known hemlocks worldwide, only eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock are at risk since they lack natural uh, resistance and have no natural predators. And they likely arrive to our region. You can see how widespread it is here through infested nursery stock where they were sold and distributed in the lower Hudson Prism region and in New York City. And you can see the native range of hemlocks in our area and just how widespread hemlock woolly adelgid is and how it continues to kind of on, on its march north. So what can we do about it here? Well, in the lower Hudson Prism region, you can see that it's widely infested here, but there's still a need to map it. So even though you look at these towns and where Hemlock Woolly Adelgid is found, it might just be one little stand in which it has been recorded, but we don't know how widespread it is throughout, throughout that county, and we need your help as citizen scientists to report it. So again, we are trying to minimize the spread of this north. 
let's take a look at the Adirondack part, your northern neighbors here. I love going to the Adirondacks and enjoying camping and fishing up there. And if we can get the word out and know in our region down here where hemlock woolly adelgid is found, we know not to transport, of course, not to transport firewood up into these regions, but the more educated we can be about where it's found and how to limit its spread the better so that we can prevent it from moving in areas where it hasn't been found and also get a better idea for just how widely spread throughout these counties it truly is. And you can see the damage done by this little aphid here. And we'll go into the details of that in a second, but you can see these skeletons of hemlock trees where HWA has moved through, right? So again, it's, it's kind of stealing nutrients from these trees till they eventually die and providing these like white skeletons which used to be healthy and productive hemlock ecosystems. So going into a little bit more details of what HWA is, well, again, it's an, a little aphid-like insect here that feeds with a piercing sucking mouth part, which they insert directly into the twig. So you see how this little bug here is sort of right at the base of that needle of a hemlock here. This is a, actually a picture of HWA in its dormant stage. Um, and it's actually easiest to see right now in the winter time when it grows its cotton wool. So in this picture here, you see a little bug, almost looks like a black sesame seed, right? With a little white halo around it. And then it ends up growing this woolly, cottony mass around it that you might see at this time of year in the winter. And this is actually a great picture of it. It's like an encrusted white cottony thing along the base of the needles and along the twigs. And we're going to be going over some of the features to be on the lookout for. But what does this bug actually look like under a microscope? Well, it looks like a little like bed mite or something like that. Well, this is what the hemlock woolly adelgid looks like. And this is what it's that, remember it's got that feeding mouth part, right? That feeding stylet that inserts into the base of the needle. That creates a wound that the tree actually attempts to heal. But during that attempt to heal it, its wound kind of clogs up the twig tissue, which impedes the flow of water and nutrients to the end of the twig. So imagine the stylet going into the base of that needle and kind of stemming the flow, so to speak, of the nutrients that the hemlock needs to grow and, and survive, right? So it's preventing new, new growth till eventually the tree starves to death, starts losing its needles after a few years and actually a lack of new buds almost straight away after it starts its feeding process. You can see that it has the hemlock woolly adelgid has these little feeding pores on the edge here. Well, it has a stage in the fall where it starts to feed and develop that woolly mass. You see how that woolly mass, oops, excuse me, kind of comes out in between those pores here. So it's almost like oozing out of the, the exoskeleton of this little bug here. This is in the fall. It goes through diff different stages where it starts to create it's this cottony mass or this characteristic wool. It continues to grow and develop throughout the winter until it reaches maturity at the end of winter and begins to lay eggs, which hatch into a second generation. This one here is the fall or the cistins stage right before it starts putting on a lot of wool in the winter time. This is a closer look at its life cycle here. So it's during this time where we really need your help in this sort of winter period where it's really starts amassing these wool and becomes really obvious along the trees. Um, it goes through, you know, kind of crawling stages. Um, again, it's actually two generations going on every year where they start laying eggs, they grow up, they kind of crawl around. And it's typically during the summertime where they enter like a dormant phase. And then again, kind of grow to the base of the needle, start producing this wool in the winter. And that's why it's the best time to look right now. I also wanted to go into the fact that there is hope for this. So first of all, you know, combination of chemicals, sometimes insecticides are used um, by professionals, of course. But one area of research that we're looking into is what is called biocontrol or biological control. There's actually two predatory beetles that feed on hemlock woolly adelgid in habitats in which these coexist. And actually, even though hemlock woolly adelgid is found, the trees don't die because there are predators there. In our Eastern forests, there really is nothing that's capable of feeding on this. 
This is a common and infective beetle predator from Japan that they're doing research on to maybe be introduced here. And this one over here is actually called a Laracobius beetle or its nickname is Little Larry. It actually is native to the Pacific Northwest where hemlock woolly adelgid is found and is a pest of Western hemlock and mountain hemlock, but it's under control by this beetle here. And this is, these are specialist beetles that feed exclusively on developing an adult hemlock woolly adelgid. And there are trials now in which they're introducing some of these natural predators to control HWA in our area. So it's another means of potential control of this. Um, this is another predator that they're thinking about using as a biocontrol. These are silver flies, which are abundant predators of HWA in the West Coast. And their larvae actually prey on the eggs of hemlock woolly adulgid. And they're used in conjunction with the beetles that I just mentioned before to feed at different times of year and you know, on different stages of development of HWA. So you know, a couple of different options in biocontrol that provides hope for the future as well. And what I wanna leave you guys with is that you know, there's a lot of players in this. So the Lower Hudson Prism and New York, New Jersey Trail Conference are one, but you know, partnering with research institutions like Cornell and, uh, you know, even in New Jersey, Agricultural um, Experiment Station and R through Rutgers, doing a lot of research into HWA control and how to save and preserve our hemlock habitats. And the New York State Hemlock Initiative is a big one that we're partnering with, in addition to the New York um, Natural Heritage Program, which is the host for the New York IMAP Invasives, which is a mapping distribution, uh, since kind of the central mapping database for New York State. So lots of partners in this fight. And what we really need is you guys, citizen science monitors and ways of participating. So we are partnering with New York IMAP Invasives for the HWA Winter Mapping Challenge, which is happening between February 12th and March 12th. I'm gonna give you some details on how to participate in a second, but right now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of hemlock, woolly adulgid and hemlock ID. So you are able to contribute to these processes. Now's the time of the video to go over the ID characteristics of hemlock and hemlock woolly adelgid, because if you're going to go out and find the adelgid and report that, you need to know what you're looking for in, in the hemlock itself. This is actually a picture of a profile of a hemlock tree, and you can kind of see that the branches just aren't as dense as a lot of the, let's say, like the pines or spruces that you would find. It's a very feather-like appearance to its branches, and we'll be talking about that Here's a little close up of the branch itself and the little tiny pine cones that we'll be talking about in a second here. Other clues to be on the lookout for. And then, of course, the white uh, cottony masses, which we'll get to at the end of this ID section here. So, what, you know, as opposed to what to look at first, I definitely recommend looking at the branches first, looking for clues like cones and needle arrangement and color and shape and those sorts of things. So let's get into some more details on that. So first of all, I had mentioned the branch structure and appearance of a hemlock. So hemlocks have a very feather-like appearance. Imagine like a bird feather, right? If you plucked it off, the needles are arranged almost two-dimensionally and kind of come off of that, uh, come off of the branch itself and sort of like, you know, um, in parallel to one another, right? Uh, so that's one thing to look at. This almost like feather-like appearance. And you contrast that with a spruce, which I like tend to think of as very saggy or like a drooping appearance. You see the difference here, how these, how these branches are more upright and feathery versus spruces, for example, tend to droop a little bit, right? Well, if you really want to know for sure, though, it's kind of take a closer look at those needles, which can really differentiate the different conifers in our area. So let's take a look at the hemlocks first. So first of all, Hemlock needles are very shiny, deep and green on the top, which you can't see here, but on the undersides, they have almost these racing stripes down them. You see these two white parallel stripes on the undersides of hemlocks? Well, spruces aren't gonna have those sort of racing stripe appearance to them. And the other difference with the main spruces are that hemlocks tend to be more rounded. Spruces have that almost like pointed end at it as well. I also want you to look at the needle arrangement along this. You see how there's a needle coming off here and then you've got this, this little stem here and then another needle coming off there. So they're almost like that feather-like appearance that I was talking about where they're coming off right next to each other along this sort of branch axis. But in spruces, the needles are coming out 
all around that branch, almost like circling around it, right? Versus this is more of a two dimensional appearance to it. So that's the one huge difference between say spruces and hemlocks, sort of rounded tips, white racing stripes and sort of two dimensional appearance to it. Well, how does this all differ from say a fur, right? Well, you really got to look at how those needles attach. Take a look at the fur needles. You see how it's going around in three dimensions again versus hemlock only going off two. And the other way that you can tell, just because there is some sort of whitish bits on fir trees, which can, can be confusing, look at how those needles are attaching to the branch. You see how they're almost like little suction cups, like they're almost like sucked onto that branch here. Versus hemlocks, there is more like longitude, excuse me, more like longitudinal, right? So they're, they're almost like longer um, bits that are attaching at the ends here versus like a suction cup appearance to the spruces or sorry, to the firs versus the spruces have a little bit more of a brownish appearance typically at where they are attaching and they're attaching individually, right? As are hemlocks, they're attaching, those needles are attaching individually. You contrast that to pine trees, which is really interesting, right? So take a look at a pine needle. Well, those pines actually are attached to twigs by pegs in bundles of two, three, or five, depending on the type of pine. And pines almost tend to have like a very like couche-like appearance. Remember that like ball you used to play with? It was like almost like couches. Well, pines kind of have their needles going all around it. They tend to, the needles cluster together and are attached to the twigs by pegs versus individual attachment to those twigs, right? In hemlocks and in uh, pine needles, again, they're kind of clustered together and more of like a poofy pine appearance to it, right? Like almost like couch balls. So that's how I like to tell the difference between pines and hemlocks. You can also, of course, look at the fruit or seeds or cones of these. So remember that conifers produce cones. Those are woody cones or females which produce seed, right? Well, hemlock cones are actually really, really tiny. They are just like maybe the size of my thumbnail or something. They're teeny, teeny, tiny versus a spruce cone almost looks like a big cigar versus, and the pines are almost like, almost like have a come to a little bit more of a pointed tip and those individual like, you know, fruiting structures or whatever. They are they're, they let overlap less than say in a spruce, right? But look at the difference. I mean, the hemlocks are just so much smaller and tiny. It's like kind of cuter, you know. And again, the needles are a little bit more rounded here. So lots of ways to tell the difference between them. All right, now that we've gone over the hemlock ID, I really wanted to put right next to each other a healthy hemlock twig right next to an unhealthy one right there that is infested with hemlock woolly adelgid. So here is that feathery appearance of a healthy hemlock I was talking about. You see that deep green that's here, right? On the one side of it, very, very deep green. You can see how this almost like two-dimensional structure to it, right? You see how they lay flat, those rounded tips I was talking about before, and very, very glossy, right? So as I flip this over to the underside, you can also see those like those white sort of racing stripes that you're seeing there as well, right where my finger is. You see how that white kind of pops out? Well, let's contrast that with a branch that I found in our area with hemlock woolly adelgid infestation, right? So here is a branch infested with it. Those are those white cottony masses right next to my finger. Sometimes you'll see the actual black dots of the bug itself right next to it. Um, you don't always find that, but you see how they're found at the base of those needles. So yeah, you can still see those white racing stripes pointing out, but this tree branch is really on the out, outs and almost along every single part of this needle you can see these white cottony masses in my hand here so this is what you are on the lookout for and you can see the scale of what we're looking at with my thumb there right so these white cottony masses i just pulled this in um, late january uh so this is about the stage of the development that you would see of this i also just since we're here and, and want to do some comparisons just to compare you know that that spruce that i was talking about which you can see up here you see how the needles are coming out in three dimensions of this and they're much pointier versus the two dimensions here of the hemlock. So if you see them right next to each other, it's really obvious how these needles spiral around this twig here 
all like all the way around that branch there versus the hemlocks. It, it's really pretty two dimensional. Let's also compare to the poofy pines, right? That almost like couch like appearance here is a pine. I mean, that's very, very different from say a hemlock. So you shouldn't have too many problems distinguishing between that. And of course, if you can get at this here, you can see the scale of those little tiny, those really cute um, needles of the, hem or the, excuse me, the pine cone of the hemlock. You see it here in my, and that I'm holding in my hand is basically the size of my, my thumbnail, right? So that you could also look for those cues and just for scale here. I mean, this is what you're talking about. Uh, the, the difference in, in cones here, right? So little tiny hemlock cone, uh, versus, you know, this, uh, this spruce that you're finding here. Uh, so, you know, really, really obvious. So this is what I'm looking for. Look for those white cottony masses and you know what to post to iNaturalist or IMAP Invasives. Really hope that to see you out there. We are about to start our Wooly Bully Mapping Challenge. It is a winter mapping challenge that runs from February 12th to March 12th. We would love to have your participation, which is a collaboration with IMAP Invasives, which is the clearinghouse for reporting in New York State. And to our New Jersey residents, you can participate too, because we remember that you know, invasive species, you know, no, no boundaries. So we need good reporting in New Jersey as well. And just, just because we know it's in most of the counties in New Jersey and New York doesn't mean that we know every stand has it. So mapping is still critical in our region to help prevent further spread. So how can you participate? Well, you can participate in our normal, regular, iNaturalist-based EcoQuest challenge. So if you have been a veteran, you are a veteran EcoQuest challenge participant, just use iNaturalist to report and post all observations under iNaturalist to Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. And what that actually looks like is that cottony mass, right? You can also post to our, or actually go and find out more details at our EcoQuest website for more details. You can see it down here and that's one place to go. And a second way to participate is you can post directly to IMAP Invasives. Remember, this is now a state in New York State it is a statewide challenge that's happening February 12th to March 12th. And you can actually enter prizes and enter, a, enter to win prizes in a, a, this actual competition by going to NewYorkIMAPInvasives.com and reporting directly to that app. You can sign up for a training with them if you want to put, report directly and enter into the actual competition. Or again, you can just go straight to iNaturalist like you've been doing in previous challenges and report it that way. So, of course, you've got questions, you want to email us, the contact is invasives at nynjtc.org. Here's another look at our webpage site. If you have further questions or want to know how to participate in either the IMAP uh, Invasives Challenge directly or just through our EcoQuest Challenge. And once again, want to say thank you to our partners for all of their great work um, and for their funding. And we hope to see you on the Wooly Bully EcoQuest Challenge for February and beginning parts of March. Hope to see you out there.